Today's talk is titled Seva, Selfless Service, Walk the Walk, to be given by and delivered by Jasnam Dea Singh. And I should tell you that this biography, which might sound a little bit long, has been cut down to a third of what was there. Born Weber Ribeiro Dumont in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil on February 17, 1962, it wasn't until the mid-90s that Weber adopted the stage name Weber Iago, an homage to the Roma people known as the Gypsies. Since taken Amrit, the initiation into the Sikh religion, Iago has adopted the name Jasman Dea Singh. Jasma has spent all of his musical life researching different types of sounds, ultimately dedicating most of his endeavors to uniting elements of classical, jazz, and Brazilian music. In Brazil, Jasnam spent many years developing his craft as a concert pianist, as well as a composer, writing mostly piano and chamber music works. In the early 80s, he moved to Los Angeles, in 1987, he began working with notable musicians such as Moacir Santos and flautist James Newton. In 1990, he moved to the Monterey Peninsula where he formed different ensembles over the years, the most important in his career being the sextet Zen Blend in 1991, which was then categorized as esoteric jazz. Also in the 90s, Jazz Nam, still under the name Weber Drummond, recorded two CDs with the great Brazilian guitar player Romero Lubombo and was a band leader at jazz festivals all over the world in Brazil, Mexico, the US, France, Belgium, China, and South Korea to name a few. Jasnam has also performed extensively as a solo artist and sad sideman in Italy, Luxembourg, New York, Japan, and the Czech Republic. He has released several CDs over the years, Children of the Wind, which you would love and spring will stay here jazz Nam has made constant appearances also at the monterey jazz festival in 2005 jazz Nam was commissioned by the carmel bach festival to write a composition uniting different musical genres such as classical and jazz the result being jazz concertino for piano and string orchestra jazz Nam's experience as an educator has brought him to clinics and workshops in Brazil, Belgium, California, and the renowned Jazz School in Berkeley, California. He has written music for several plays, Bar Lies by Anna Luca, which is my pseudonym, and arranged songs for the Kepler Project by Nina Wise. For Anna Luca, Iago composed an original score to accompany the novel. He has also worked with Darius Wallace on a program that has been repeatedly successfully performed in Portland with the Chamber Orchestra called a poet, actor, performer, singer called My Sword, My, my Word is, My Words are My Swords, thank you. As a producer, Jasnam has recently accomplished the project Camino Cruzado, a CD of, by the Russian-American vocalist Marsha Campagna. Over the years, Jasmine Dea Singh has received countless commissions by different artists as well as musical institutions all over the world, including the American Composers Forum. In 2009, Singh's CD, still as Weber Iago, in duo with Jovino Santos Neto, received the Latin Grammy nomination for Best Instrumental Album. Jasmine's current project is the band Seva which he co-leads with the guitarist composer from Bulgaria, Christoph Vachev. Currently, Jasnam Dea Singh works extensively as a performer, composer, and arranger. Please welcome Jasnam Dea Singh. Good morning. Thank you so much for your kind and generous um, reception here. Um, it had been a long time since I came to Portland. I mean, not to Portland, to Cambria. And um, I'm very happy to be here this weekend with you all, playing music and uh, sharing a little bit of my uh, spiritual journey. What I chose to share with you this morning 
uh, is titled Seva, Selfless Service, Walk the Walk, exploring the notion of one's spiritual life being demonstrated with actions rather than just words. When we examine most, if not all, the religions in the world, we learn that the founders of all of them had not particularly set out to create a religion, but a way of life. First, I would like to spend a minute or so on the very word religion, which comes from the word redigare, Latin for, uh, it means to reconnect. So these masters and sages who became founders of religions have been showing us throughout time how to reconnect. But what and who are, are we reconnecting with? With our source? With our creator? And by becoming the followers of this or that master, does it imply then that we are to take steps on a particular path? This is very interesting and all until we stumble on the questions. Which path? How many paths are there? Which one is the right one for me or yet? Which one is the right one, period? Perhaps all the conflicts that have existed for millennia have to do with that, with the very fact that although religion has provided many beautiful and positive teachings, we seem to have gotten too attached to something else, which is the notion that there has to be the one right road to take. Needless to say that that kind of think, thinking has created a scenario where people spend more time on the business of convincing others or proselytizing and not so much on the work towards growth. During my talk here today, I would like to double down on a few topics that I covered the first time I spoke here via Zoom about Sikhi or Sikhism. Some of them have to do with the very things that attracted me to the Sikh faith. The first one I want to bring up is the one called Nam Japna, which consists of the remembrance of God by repeating and focusing the mind on God's name or identity. That is a kind of, is a contemplation or meditation, but the kind of meditation one does without necessarily having to be sitting down. You could be walking, driving, working, you name it. And at the same time, chanting or thinking the word Wahe Guru, uh, Punjabi for wondrous God. The concept behind that is that you think of God with each breath. And why is that so powerful? Because once that practice becomes second nature, so does what comes from it, which is your actions being filled with and inspired by God's energy. Another tenet in Sikhi is called Vand Shakna, and that means sharing one's earnings and one's time towards community and humanitarian service. Much is said about the religion Sikhi being a practical one, and that can be summed up by the following statement. Sikhi consists of practical living in rendering service to humanity and engendering tolerance and brotherly love towards all. The Sikh gurus did not advocate for retirement from the world in order to attain salvation. That can be achieved, achieved by anyone who earns an honest living and leads a normal life. My perception of all this is, if we strive to have our actions inspired by the divine, then it doesn't matter which religion we practice. In fact, it might not matter if we have a religion at all. 
The reason I chose Siki is because it spoke to me on a very profound level. level. However, I'm aware that different people are inspired by different philosophies and teachings. And that take, takes us back to what, what I brought up here a few minutes ago, the choice of a path. As we search for one, for path, we'll notice that our teachers are everywhere. In fact, over the years, I have noticed them quite often and in various circumstances. I have seen teachers in different parts of the world. They speak different languages, have different backgrounds and levels of education. They are women and men. They are children and people of advanced age. They all have one thing in common though. They all demonstrate their spirituality with their actions, with their kindness, with their presence and unwavering willingness to give. I don't know if they practice a religion or go to churches of any kind. I know some who even claim to be atheists. I remember vividly when in 1996, I read about Kishia Thomas, an 18-year-old black woman who, during a rally in her hometown in Michigan, shielded with her own body a white supremacist and Ku Klux Klan member who fell on the ground and was about to be beaten by a group of people. That story inspires me to this day. She is my teacher. Back when I still live in Brazil, I used to hear a story about a farmer who had his farm and crops frequently damaged by all kinds of animals. He would go out, capture those animals, get them in crates, drive, drive them outside his property and release them. He is my teacher. All people who dedicate their time and energy to promoting the well-being of anyone, whether they do that through random acts of kindness or through an organized volunteering system, they are my teachers. You see, I do appreciate rhetoric that promotes spiritual life. There are times for that, when we engage in speeches with the intention of disseminating spiritual ideas close to our heart. Here we are with you so kindly opening up this forum for me to share with you. But let's be clear, all the most beautiful words we may utter, in my humble opinion, must be followed by actions to match. In the Sikh tradition, we have a practice named Seva, which means selfless service. That practice is directed at people from all walks of life, not only Sikhs. One of the, one of the mo most well-known Sevas by the Sikhs is the Langar, or community kitchen, in which people are fed regardless of them being part of the Sangat congregation or not. In fact, Sri Harmandir Sahib, also known as the Golden Temple in Amritsar, in the state of Punjab, India, feeds between 150,000 and 200,000 people every single day. And that practice is carried out all over the world, wherever Sikhs are present. I've been reading about the Unitarian Universalist principles, and I'm happy to say they're all in consonance with tenets of the Sikh faith. I think most faiths have more in common than we seem to realize. I would like to point out specifically acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. And you finish the phrase with in our congregations. But I believe that can be applied everywhere. Also, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, which, by the way, reminds me of a principle in Sikhi that goes like this. Realization of truth is higher than all else. Higher still is truthful living. Many years ago, I was playing a gig in a hotel. And during my break, this nice gentleman struck up a conversation with me. And it didn't take long for us to go from music to politics and then spirituality. He then said something that has stayed with me to this day. 
I want for the things that I think, that I say, and that I do to be the same. It seems so simple, right? But I wonder how often we are capable of achieving that consistency, a consistency that has its origin in being true to oneself. Our conflicts with one another derive from ego and the illusion of separateness, the very illusion of us versus them. And that is enough to raise up walls and promote fear, which in turn promotes hatred. And that's why it feels to me that actions end up being a stronger language. Let's face it, we may be in a part of the world where they don't speak our language and we don't speak theirs. But to, this, but to the rescue come all those elements of our universal communication. Our eyes and the way we look at people, the kindness in our voice, even if, if we don't know each other's words. Best of all, the energy we exude, which can speak volumes as we relate to each other. Let me tell you, musicians do experience that kind of pure expression of universal communication. You may be walking down the street somewhere in Lithuania, carrying your guitar, and before you know it, you'll be taking part in a jam session in someone's practice studio or in some unassuming bar. Back to words. There comes a time when our beautiful words get easily interpreted as cliches. After all, it costs nothing to express them. Now, getting out there in the world and doing, initiating projects, taking real steps towards accomplishing good things for our neighbor, far and near, that's when our paths get serious, when we have prayer in action. And actually, that reminds me of another concept that I would like, I would like to share with you and is the one named Midi Pity. Midi represents temporal authority and Pity represents spiritual authority. Basically, it's about integrating our spiritual awareness with the earthly life and everything it comprises. To me, the question that persists is, what is all this for? I mean, choosing a path, a faith, a community, a religion, what are we aiming at? I feel that one way or another, throughout time, masters and sages have been laying down the foundation for the students to achieve self-knowledge. And that reminds me of a quote by a great author, Koji. Darkness cannot be destroyed but it can be eliminated by substitution with light. Similarly, ego cannot be destroyed or wished away, but it can, it can only be substituted with the realization, awareness, or consciousness of, divine, of the divine light. When we Sikhs talk about Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhi or Sikhism, we refer to him as the light he was in the world. He spent years of his life traveling all over India, as well as other countries. His travels are called Udasis, or divine journeys, and he did four of them. He traveled with his companion, Be Mardana, who was his follower and also a musician who accompanied him playing stringed instruments as Guru Nanak sang his inspirational verses. And Guru Nanak is considered to be the most traveled person in the world, and that's saying a lot, especially considering he and Be Mardana, his companion, did it all on foot or by boat. These travels were not intended to get converts or adepts to a congregation. Rather, Guru Nanak aimed at showing people how they could connect with the divine light as they walked on their own path. The word Guru actually is the contraction of two words, Gu, darkness, and Ru, which means light. 
So the word guru means the one who shows the light which dispels the darkness. How much of our darkness is self-inflicted? Sometimes I have the, the feeling that most of it is. Are we not in touch with teachings or do we choose not to receive them? Could it be that we're not receiving them because of all the noise in our minds? In the music, music world, we are in the music world, we frequently talk about silence being as important as sounds. And that's a great analogy for how we conduct ourselves in the world and how we communicate with one another. A big part of the dynamics of communication comes from a genuine willingness to listen in the concept that listening may be even more important than speaking. I believe that before all that happens, we must have a real desire for quiet, for silence and introspection, and pretty much understanding that any conversation we have with others really begins with them. Actually, everything begins with them. Listen, we refer to God and we point up. We talk about God and we look up. Why not point within? Why not look within? If we do that and we accept that we are all one, then we realize that what we find in ourselves, in ourselves, we'll find inside others because there is no other. And that's the very reason why our spiritually, spirituality expressed in action is something we end up doing for ourselves and our very lives. In closing, um, I would like to say that everything I'm sharing with you all here today feels like a lengthy expressed thought. It's like you are allowing me to indulge in this thinking out loud. By doing this, I feel like I'm reminding myself of how I want to be and where I want to go. This journey gets to be renewed every single day. And the beauty of, beauty of that is, if we engage in daily self-discovery self and make conscious decisions of which directions to take, we immediately eliminate guilt from our lives because we accept that our so-called shortcomings are not life sentences, but life lessons. Thank you.